Episode 6 starts off with the Dwarven General asking for a report. Someone tells him that the Kawagawa are trying to invade their stronghold, meaning that there are enough of them to overpower the magic defense items they've installed. The General doesn't want to, but he orders them to seal the gates even though there are soldiers still fighting out there. The General tells the soldier that tens of thousands of lives in Fia Jetta are more important. As they're closing the gates, the magicians fire lightning attacks, and then the gate closes. He tells them that they will be fine, the fangs and teeth of the Kawagoa can't tear through their gates. A dwarf walks up to the general and suggests that they consider abandoning Fiojeta. Then a dwarf riding a lizard, or whatever it is, brings the general a message. An undead appeared at the above ground entrance wanting to talk about the Kawagoa, and then the intro plays. And I still don't like the intro. As the dwarves are walking to the entrance, the messenger tells them that the undead said they got information from a Kawagoa they captured in Fio Reho, and they found out that the Kawagoa figured out a way to get across the Great Chasm and rushed over to warn them. Ainz greets them, and the general introduces himself, and Ainz tells him that he's honored the general himself has come to greet him, and asks how are things with the Kawagoa. The general turns to his men, and tells them that it seems the sorcerer king is already aware of everything. He tells Ainz that they've managed to hold the Kawagoa at bay for now, but since they have no additional forces, they are considering abandoning the city. Ainz tells him that he's come to establish a relationship with their kingdom, and it would be problematic if their kingdom were to fall, and asks if they would consider accepting his assistance. The general tells him that he would have to discuss this with his superiors, the Regenesi Council. Ainz says he doesn't mind the wait. However, there's a saying that a congress often dances but does not progress. This causes the general to open the gates and asks for Ainz to lend him his strength. We then see things from the Kawagoa side. They remark that the great chasm that's famous for its impenetrant ability is useless once they manage their way around it and that the rare minerals the dwarves have will soon be theirs. The Red One orders the one to his left to report to the main force behind them that they've secured the invasion route. The gate begins to open, so the Kawagoa in front of it start to rush in, but they're greeted by two death knights who begin to slaughter them. The Kawagoa start to retreat back across the bridge, and the death knights follow. The Red Leader tells them to destroy the bridge, they do, and as the Death Knights are falling, it grabs a Kawagoa next to it and throws it at the Red Leader, who is hanging on the rope, which barely misses. We find out that the Red Leader's name is Yotz. Yotz comments on how the Death Knights looked like golems, and the dwarves must have somehow tamed them, and orders for a retreat. Back with the dwarves, Ainz is in a waiting room, and the general tells them that their kingdom currently has no king, and is run by the Regenesi Council. Ainz then realizes that the Death Knights he sent out have been eliminated. Thinking to himself, he says that they were eliminated at the same time. If it was the work of a single individual, they'd have to be level 45 at the very least, and wonders if he finally found a player. Player would have no problem taking care of two Death Knights, and that maybe he's found the person responsible for brainwashing Shautir. Ainz introduces himself to the Regenesi Council. The Secretary General thanks Ainz for saving their kingdom. Without him, the kingdom would have fallen. The Governor of Caves and Mines goes over that Ainz wishes to establish a friendly trade relationship with them. Ainz says that that's correct. He hopes to interest them with fresh vegetables and foods that are hard to obtain in their kingdom, as well as liquor from the Human Kingdoms and the Sorcerer Kingdom. The merchant guildmaster asks Ainz what goods he wants in exchange. Ainz tells him that he wants mineral ores. His kingdom lacks a good source for them. He also desires equipment. Dwarves are known for making very high quality equipment. The forge master thanks Ainz for helping them, but they can't give an immediate answer to his request. Ainz says that's fine and brings up the Kawagoa. and confirms that he took care of their initial attack on their own accord, correct? The general says yeah, 
If the gates had been breached without his presence, they would have needed to mobilize the people and fight to the death within the city. Ainz tells them that the city of Fiojeta is still not completely safe, and asks if they will accept his assistance. With the power of his kingdom, he can prevent the invasion for quite some time, and it's possible that they could go to the Kaugoa's nest in Fio Burkana and reclaim the old dwarven royal capital. The general tells him that that would be too dangerous. The eight clans of Kaugoa have been unified, becoming a powerful force under a single clan lord. The high priest of Earth mentions that even if they were able to reach the capital, he'd have to deal with a frost dragon, but Ayn says that's fine. The forge master butts in and says that this sounds too good to be true. Why would he help them to such an extent? What does he truly want? The brew master tries to calm him down, but he says it's like a complete stranger offering you some delicious booze. There's got to be some kind of ulterior motive. Ainz tells him that his suspicion is warranted, and says that first, he'd rather have friendly relations with a race that has a concept of trade and more common sense than the Kawagoa and that the losing side is always more grateful for help than the winning side. The second reason is that they have something he wants for his services. He wants to invite all the runesmiths to his own kingdom. The forge master asks if he wants to turn them into slaves, but Ayn says how can I turn people of a friendly country into slaves? He wants to have them forge items in his country. The guild master asks, how about getting exclusive first access to the purchase of any room-crafted items and set? Ainz tells him no, that's not enough of a benefit for him. He wants to become the exclusive producer of room technology. The general asks if he could wait in the waiting room while they come up with a reply. The dwarves break the tension by saying that Ainz is an insanely powerful monster and that he's definitely evil, and that he can't even drink with that kind of body, so he's not trustworthy. The general butts in and says that without Ainz, their kingdom will perish. After the deliberations, they tell Ainz that they accept his terms. So Ainz tells them that he will lend them enough forces to reclaim the stronghold and hold off the Kawagoa. They also agree to send all their runesmiths to his kingdom, but they would like to send investigation teams to check on their fellow dwarves in the future. Ainz says no problem and promises to allow their investigators into the sorcerer kingdom. Thinking to himself again, Ayn says that labor standards often fail to protect the laborers, but he doesn't plan on creating people like Hito Hito san in his kingdom. He plans to create labor laws that will impress any visiting dwarves. It cuts to Gondo gathering all the runesmiths and waiting for Ayn to show up. As he walks in, the dwarves are talking so he's about to silence them, but Shoutir interrupts him and says silence while holding up a bottle of liquor. Ainz introduces himself and tells him that his business with them is very simple and straightforward request. He'd like for them to come to his kingdom to develop new technologies to imbue items with magic through runecraft. One of the dwarves stands up and asks why runecraft specifically. It's a craft that's already on the decline in their own country. Ainz pulls a sword out of the void the dwarves begin to rush forward to look at it, but Shautir stops them, and Ainz demands silence. And asks if it's possible to engrave 20 runes on an item like this sword. They say it's impossible. There are 6 runes that were engraved on the dwarven king's hammer during the great age of runecrafting 200 years ago. Ainz says I see. Then this must be a weapon created through lost technology. He tells them that he wants everyone here to rediscover that lost knowledge. As Ainz is leaving, Gonda walks out and asks if the Regenesi Council agreed to send all their runesmiths to the Sorcerer Kingdom. Ainz says yeah. Gondo begins to cry because that means the country really has given up on runecrafting. Ainz comforts him by telling him that he believes in the great potential of runesmiths. Even if one country tosses runesmiths aside, Another is here to welcome you. He informs Gondo that he will be leaving tomorrow for a few days because he's going to go reclaim their royal capital. As Ainz is leaving, the general tells him that Gondo volunteered to be their guide to the capital. Gondo tells Ainz that there is a valuable book about runecrafting, 
passed down through the royal family and the royal treasury of the capital, and that he wants it no matter what. Ainz asks Gondo if he's asking him to help him with robbery. Isn't that one of your country's treasures? Gondo tells him what's the point of a country that's forsaken runecrafting keeping a book about the subject. So Ainz is like, I feel like I'll suddenly get a bout of blindness when we happen to pass by the royal treasury. They open the gates and we see the aftermath of the Death Knights. Ainz uses Mass Fly to fly across the destroyed bridge. Ainz asks if the Kawagoa did this. There would be no need to destroy the bridge if they had someone strong enough to deal with the Death Knights. As they land, Ainz tells Shaltir that he will brief her on some details while they have the chance. They are going to a dangerous area. He believes it to be dangerous because an enemy that can easily take down two Death Knights will be there, and that she has to think of the actions the enemy will take. What the enemy wants most is information, a gauge of their strength. They'll probably send out weaker opponents first to test their strength. As Ainz is going on, Aura smows the ground is about to tell Ainz what really happened, but he shushes her, and tells Shatir that she has to keep thinking. Gondo mentions that there are still two dangerous areas ahead. The second is a red-hot sea teeming with magical beasts, but he flies over it. The last is the Labyrinth of Death. He tells them that they can't fly through it because of the deadly gas. However, Shaltir tells them that undead creatures aren't affected by poison. Ainz protects Aura and Gondo with magic and casts Light of Titania to guide them using the best route. After passing those obstacles, they will reach the capital soon. Ainz starts to tell them the plans. Aura and Shaltir will deal with the Kawagoa. If they submit, fine. If they resist, show them the power of Nazarick. Ainz will take care of the dragon. It cuts back to season 1 during that escort mission where he remembers the female mage mentioning the frost dragon and says that it's unfortunate that she was killed, then the episode ends. Some personal thoughts. I like that Ainz keeps using the silence gesture that he practiced, I don't remember when he did, like last season or season before that, but he's getting some mileage out of it, and it's working. I mean, it, it commands the room. It's a good pose. But yeah, it was a good episode. I don't really have much to say about it. But that's about it. See ya.